your textbook covers topics in a certain order. And what I want to tell you is um, I want to cover it in a different order because um, the way they are doing it is not, it's not quite historically correct order. And I want to be more closer to history of development. So, um, so the order in which, uh, I guess you can't really read the tabs. But I put them in the order that I kind of want you to cover them in. So do read the textbook for your own benefit. There's a lot of materials that's in the textbook we kind of never address in the lecture. And you know it's better for you to know those things than not. So do read the textbook. But just so that you know, I'm kind of skipping around. In fact, think where I start will be a little bit before chapter 10, section 3. That's the historically correct place to start. Um, so last time we actually talked a little bit about x-rays. right? Do people know how x-ray was first discovered? Um, from the cathode rays? Yeah, cathode rays. What are cathode rays? Uh, electron. Electron. OK, let me, let me rephrase it. So let me, discovery of x-rays. So there's a device called a cathode ray tube. Um, how many here have heard of something called a CRT? That's how people used to make TVs. Um, and those old TVs, this stands for cathode ray tube, television or screen or whatever. So what a cathode ray tube is, um, you have a cathode in a vacuum tube. A anyone here know, uh, know the distinction between cathode and anode? Yeah, which, is, which one is positive? Cathode is positive? I thought cathode was negative. Cathode is the one that emits electrons, so it's got to be negative, right? Yeah. Uh, never mind. <laughs> I know what a cathode is. I don't need to know what cation is. <laughs> okay. So a cathode. <laughs> uh, so the cathode ray tube is imagine a evacuated tube, and you have an electrode poking inside. And so this is physics. So this one I know. This electrode has to be negatively charged. So it's a negatively charged by, you know, you can do it with a battery by use of high voltage device or something. So um, let's see, how do I, um, let me label it as, so you hook to this up to some negative high voltage thing. So it's negatively charged. Then what people figured out is then there are some kind of particles that's emanating from this cathode. If you charge it negatively enough, then there are just particles that kind of come out of it. You can visualize these particles in many different ways. The way your old screen television does it is you have a glass here, and you coat it with some fluorescent material that when it's struck by one of these cathode rays, it'll be struck, it'll glow green. That's the old monochromatic green screen that you may have seen. Or if you fill up this tube with a little bit of gas, like argon is common one, then you will see a green glow as these particles kind of move through the gas, exciting the gas. So you can um, kind of collimate the beam if you want, you know, put some barriers here and here. And we just, then this is kind of geometrically limits where the beam can go. So with this collimation device, you would have a kind of cathode ray that um, goes like this. Okay. So this is um, this ray is this is what people would call cathode ray. And so cathode ray tube is that device. And I hesitated when Gao just said the cathode ray is electron. Is the subtle distinction is cathode ray is a beam of electrons. <laughs> right? It's a, so when people were initially studying these devices, they didn't know what cathode ray was. 
but um, so the, the discovery of electron is credited to J.J. Thomson. He's the one who um, kind of identified it as a distinct particle, separate from any other elements, any other atom. It's its own particle. He characterized it as a mass to charge ratio. You guys actually, well, for those of, I don't know if you guys do it at Laney and other campuses, but here we have a, a E over N experiment in physics 4B where you measure that uh, charge to mass ratio of the electron, cathode ray. So what cathode ray is beam of electrons. So what you should imagine is um, this is really emitting these electrons. And um, you can make an arrangement so that um, the, maybe these two plates are charged. So you have a negative high voltage here hooked into uh, Positive, mm, positive high voltage here, so it's like a better, uh, so it's like a battery connected to both of them. Except it's a super high voltage. It can be thousands of volts or tens of thousands of volts uh, or even hundreds of thousands of volts. Then when an electron goes here, and if uh, you know many of them will hit this target, but if it ends up going through, then the electron that's moving out here might have as much energy as, so you know, if we, let's say that the voltage difference here, delta V, is about 100 uh, kilovolts, 100,000 volts. Then after electron goes through this much potential difference, it'll have kinetic energy of about 100 kilo electron volt, right? All this is actually, it's a fairly doable. 100 kilovolt is not that high as far as high voltages go. People can put like megavolt on a, well, you can, 100 kilovolt, it's small enough, you can actually get that on that device. That uh, Van de Graaff generator, if it's clean, free of any nicks and defects, then it, that can get 100,000 um, volts. So, um, so people were playing with this device, they were doing experiments with it, and this is what they discovered. Somebody, I'm gonna say Röntgen, uh, one of the German physicists, he discovered that if you put a photographic plate here, some kind of film, photographic plate, something that'll be activated if a light shines on it, that um, after a while, this would be exposed. Um, and um, I guess somehow he traced the source of the exposure back to cathode ray tube. And he started, and that probably happened through barriers, I'm assuming. So he started putting other things, um, like um, let's say a block of wood between the cathode ray tube and the photographic plate. And this photographic plate would still be exposed. So, so this was a kind of, he attributed it to something that's coming from this uh, plate. It's not the cathode ray because the cathode ray is stopped by this plate at the end. So there's something else that's coming from here. Something else that's coming from here. And whatever it is, it's something that's able to pass through wood. It's able to pass through a lot of materials that visible light can't really. And um, it's a strange property. People thought it was strange. So this was named X-ray as a kind of, well, it's a strange ray. We don't, it goes, seems to go through a lot of material. We don't really understand what it is. This is before development of quantum mechanics. This is like 1870s or 1880s, 90s. So uh, it was called X-ray, but I guess uh, to an extent, of, from an experimentalist view, this is fairly easy to understand. The moment you turn off this cathode ray device, this X-ray also turns off. So it's something that's coming from cathode ray tube. When you have these high energy cathode rays that are suddenly stopped, then it emits this X-ray. Now for us, with the perspective of quantum mechanics, we understand what all this is, right? Kinda. What, is, what kind of particle is X-ray? 
it, it's a photon, right? It's a high energy photon. So what's going on is that this electron with the energy of 100 kilo electron volt, when, let's say, when it suddenly comes to a stop here, then it's emitting this, uh, it, its energy is being lost as light. So this light, what this is, is a photon with energy of 100 kilo electron volt. That's really what that X-ray is. This high energy cathode ray or high energy electron is losing energy as it's suddenly coming to a stop and that energy is being carried away by a high energy photon. Yeah. But you know, it's an exciting thing for people to study. And um, now the rest of what we are talking about with the nuclear physics actually has nothing to do with the X-ray. The reason I started the introduction with this is because it leads to a discovery of something called radioactivity. So discovery of radioactivity is what I really want you to talk about. And the reason people noticed the radioactivity was because people who are working on similar things as this discovered something that was emitting uh, radiation that was uh, similar to X-ray. But unlike X-ray, it wasn't coming from cathode ray tube. It didn't have a power source. You couldn't turn it off. It was just coming from some material. So that discovery is somewhere described in your textbook here. Um, the guy named the Becquerel and, um, and uh, let's see. Wait, pinable there. Mm. And I will just uh, tell you the story briefly, maybe. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you the story. I'm not sure if it'll be brief. Um, so Becquerel is the guy who discovered, um, discovered radioactivity. And I guess the, right, he's the right, yeah. <laughs> so um, he, this is the sort of cartoon illustrate. so you can read that too, <laughs> that works fine. Cartoon illustration would be, so the, X-ray was discovered with the exposure of photographic plates. And radioactivity was described, um, discovered in a similar way. Somebody, for some reason, stored photographic plates. So photo plate, photographic plates near some material. Um, this guy, Becquerel, was studying uh, uranium salts as a, he was uh, studying some fluorescence or something. Radioactivity is new, that's not what he was looking for. He was uh, studying uranium salts for something uh, re relating to uh, fluorescence and he happened to store this photographic plate near uranium salt. So uranium and I don't know, I don't know what else uranium makes compound with. Let's say chlorine. I don't. I'm not a chemist. Um, so, um, so, um, so he had some. He, so he had some deposit uh, uranium salt um, stored nearby, and um, this is kind of a, one of the weird things. Um, it's kind of e easy to imagine how this discovery wouldn't have been made. So he had the photographic plates stored here near some material that he didn't know had a special property beyond the fluorescence. And for whatever reason, he decided to develop these unexposed plates. Who knows why he did that, but he decided to develop these plates. And when he did, he found out they were exposed. That's, I guess, when he tracked down, oh, it was stored with uranium salts. So this uranium salt must be emitting some kind of ray that's uh, X-ray-like. But it's uh, obviously not an X-ray because we know how X-ray is produced. So whatever this is, it's a strange kind of radiation like X-ray, but it is not quite X-ray. But this is the beginning point of study of radioactivity. Because with the radioactivity, it's very um, specific to material property. 
So uh, most of the things you see around you are not radioactive. Um, I think we are legally required to be paid that way. <laughs> we are not, um, people used to work with radium, like a, a painting clocks with radium. And like a, you Google search radium girls. There are some big lawsuits about how people running the company didn't uh, properly inform their workers of the hazardous conditions they are working under. Um, so <laughs> radioactivity, it's a material specific. So uranium is a one element that has a lot of radioactive isotopes that we'll talk about. And um, so once it disco was discovered, then a lot of uh, other people were looking for more uh, radioactive elements or elements that have radioactive isotopes. I'll just throw out some names so that you know some people who've done a lot of work in radioactivity. One is a guy named Rutherford. Does that name sound familiar? Yeah, he's the one who did the Rutherford experiment. He used the alpha rays there. Those alpha rays come from uh, radioactivity. So that would be americium, but I don't think americium was discovered then. Um, the other person, I mean, there are many other names, but at least the two that I should give you is, uh, the other person is Mary, I'm not gonna be able to spell her name right, Mary Curie. So she's one of the few people who have two Nobel Prizes. I think one in physics, one in chemistry, I think. Um, and she discovered a lot of, um, uh, a lot of radioactive elements. Uh, one in particular is easy to remember. She discovered the polonium. And the reason it's easy to remember is because she's a, a scientist working in France, I think. And she named the polonium after her home country, which was, I guess, I don't know, being ruled by Russians at the time. I don't know who would be ruling Poland back, back then. But um, so polonium is one of the uh, radioactive, um, one of the elements that have radioactive um, isotopes. And, um, and um, I guess we'll um, mention some of this. And when we talk about, when we get into these radioactive isotopes, one thing you will notice is that when you look at the periodic table of elements, the, Um, I don't know what happened. Hmm. Oh, when you look at this periodic table of elements, uh, a lot of these radioactive isotopes, they will be somewhere, um, they are all somewhere down here. They are at the high N value or high Z value. Um, so uranium, is element right here, element number 92. Polonium is, um, where's polonium? PU, right? Oh, 84, yeah, polonium. And um, americium is a common alpha source that's used in your smoke detectors. Um, so a lot of these radioactive elements, they'll be found here. Cesium is, uh, there are radioactive versions of cesium. Um, so, so, um, so people started discovering. Once they uh, figured out this is something that happens, they started looking for other elements that have sim similar kind of behavior. And the, one of the main work that was done by Rutherford was he categorized these different, um, so <laughs> he categorized the, the, the rays coming from the rad radioactive element. It turns out these radioactive, or the rays from radioactivity are more complex than X-ray. It has multiple components. We now call them alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. And um, let's take a short break. And when we come back from the break, I will just go over briefly about alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. Um, it'll, that'll also serve as a kind of radiation safety. Um, 